Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Phil Beach from Navitend. Welcome to the webinar. Um, we're going to get started here in just a second. I'm just going to do a brief introduction. Uh, the purpose of this of this webinar is to show um, your how your your SaaS data, your your data that's in a cloud subscription service. In this particular webinar, we're going to be looking at Microsoft 365, and we're going to touch also on on G Suite or Google Apps or whatever it's called now. As a, it seems like they change their main their name every other week, but um, we're going to focus mostly on Microsoft 365, just illustrating why you need to protect that data even though you're in that in that cloud environment. Uh, my friend uh, Mike from Datto is gonna be helping me to do this presentation. And so um, with that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to him in a second here. Just wanna let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and we're gonna post it um, online on like LinkedIn and YouTube and We'll, we'll make it available to you um, so that you don't have to take, you know, copious notes or anything like that. Um, so that being said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Take it away. Phil, thank you so much. Um, so just very briefly, uh, everybody is muted. Um, you are able to send questions in the chat. There's a Q&A box there. We can, we can get to those, but everybody's muted. We got a, a lot of people on. Uh, very briefly about me. So my name is Mike De Palma. I'm the Senior Channel Development Manager for Datto. So we are a backup disaster recovery company based out of Norwalk, Connecticut. So about 40 miles east of Manhattan there. Um, my job is really just to go around and do these educational webinars. And, you know, I'm at a different security summit just about every week. And so a lot of these stats and stories are coming from folks like the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, those folks. And they are really focused on uh, the education piece. Because unfortunately, this, these, these cyber threats are not something we could legislate our way out of. Uh, you know, they put a lot of these restrictions on, on things and, and all these um, you know, regulations that are coming down. The bottom line is they're not helping to catch any of these guys. They're not helping to slow any of these attacks from going down. Really, what they're doing is the shifting the burden over to you guys as the business owners and saying, you know what? It's your job to, uh, to make sure you have critical backups of all your critical data that includes data from your clients, from your employees, um, your business data. And so it's all very critical and we're seeing more and more of that. And you know, the big highlight recently has been uh, ransomware as we've seen some of the very large attacks. And I'll get into some real life stories about the, the Microsoft 365 also being attacked by ransomware. But the bottom line is, you know, they're gonna ask you for some money in Bitcoin the government has now officially put out a statement, uh, the Treasury, Treasury Department put one out late last year, saying that by paying the ransom, you're at risk of violating the law, actually. I mean, it's not illegal to pay a ransom. Somebody comes in and steals my dog, I can pay a ransom. The problem is a lot of times the folks behind these attacks, they are terrorist organizations. They are enemy nation states. So by paying that ransom, you could inadvertently be funding one of these organizations that's on the terrorist list, which obviously is illegal. Now, the statement doesn't have a lot of teeth yet, but it goes back to my initial point. This is where the government is going. They wanna make sure that you have a cyber resiliency plan in place. All of your critical data is backed up and secure. And even if you survive one of these attacks, they're gonna come knocking on your door and they're gonna make you slide a piece of paper across the table that says, here's all of the things I've done to do my due diligence. Um, and if not, there could be some regulatory problems. So that just kind of sets the scary stage there. Uh, but we, when we're talking about Microsoft 365 uh, in particular, you know, we kind of joke in the last, uh, you know, 18 months, we've, the tech space has uh, accelerated 18 years, right, out of necessity. We, we are all thrown into this agile work from anywhere environment. And we saw a big explosion in folks moving to software as a service application. So if we're not familiar with the term SaaS. That's what that means, like Microsoft 365. And, you know, it's great. We, they, they're great tools. And we're seeing a huge boom in that. Uh, when we start to see the trend, and again, my in the world that I live in at Datto, we started out just kind of backing up on-premise data, on-premise servers. And although we still do that, you know, the way that the, the technology space has moved, we're, we, we are now backing up things in Microsoft 365 and Azure. And that's just the, you know, the trend that we're seeing. And so, you know, it, I, although there are still some instances where you do need an on-premise server, these tools are great and they have allowed us to continue to operate and collaborate with each other. I mean, think about it. I don't get phone calls anymore. I used to spend my whole day on my cell phone. Now 
it's always a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting. Um, even when we return to some sort of normalcy and we're back in the office, this environment is here to stay. Businesses did not make a huge investment into these technologies and then decide to pull the plug on them and go back to where we were two years ago. So when you think about Microsoft 365 in general, one of the problems is that, yeah, it's a great tool and you know it's a, it's a great way to, to run your business, but it still needs to be backed up. And when you look at some of the stats on you know who's backing up their data, I mean, less than a quarter of folks are backing up their data, even though the majority of their critical business data lives in these type of environments. Um, they do, a lot of times they will use the, the native Microsoft offering, but when you go to their forums, they will encourage you to use a third-party backup. I've done seminars with folks from Microsoft, from their, their cloud solution engineers, and they will say, you know, we're not in the world of backup. We have a backup product, but we're not in the world of backup. Just like everything else, there's a need to have that backup stored with a third party. And that's even, you know, it, you know, even the IDC is suggesting that as well. And, you know, when you think about who's being targeted. A problem is that a lot of times the stories that make the news are things like the Colonial Pipeline or the Meatpacking Company or the governments that are being hit because those are the those are the stories that people will click on, right? Big numbers, you know, $4 million payment. There's an insurance company down in Atlanta, $70 million ransomware payment. These are big. The problem is the vast majority of these attacks are actually happening at the small business level and we're not hearing about it. Less than 25% of attacks on small businesses are reported to the authorities. And there's a couple of reasons why. One is that the FBI is really not gonna put any resources into investigating this unless it's over $100,000. That number might even be higher. They just don't have the bandwidth. And the other reason, the more important reason people don't report it is because they don't want people to know they were attacked. They don't want that bad publicity. They don't want their clients and their prospects uh, under knowing that they've been attacked. Even if that data wasn't stolen, just the idea that a hack has occurred is, is really bad publicity. So we're seeing a lot of folks just kind of sweep it under the rug. So, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to get these hard numbers. But I, I did a, a, a seminar recently with a gentleman from the Department of Homeland Security, and they're pretty strict about not sharing their slides and, and all that. So I can't put the actual slide in there, but he said it publicly, so I don't mind sharing it. Their number for the amount of downtime from a ransomware attack on a small business is 16.2 days. So you start to put that into perspective of what that would do to your business if you did not have access to critical data for 16.2 days. That's what in the technology space, we call that recovery time objective. How much downtime would you incur and pour, and before you can get that data back into a production environment? That applies to these SaaS applications as well. We're seeing a huge uptick. 70% of folks will have a business disruption, and that is just with SaaS applications. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that as it occurs right now. You know, just a regular deletion through some of these sources, if it's just, a, you know, it's gone, it's been 30 days, it's out of the, uh, the inbox, um, the on average can take over 18 hours. Um, it's hard to pin down exactly what that downtime cost can be. We have a calculator that does it, and we kind of just put some averages in terms of employee size and revenue. But you could simply, you could simplify it very easily. You wanna talk about downtime. It's 500,000 minutes in a year. So you start to look at, okay, you're a million dollar company a year in revenue, that's $2 a minute. You wanna to go to the base simple. If you're a $10 million a year company, it's $20 a minute. And so start putting that in the perspective of what it would be to be down 18 hours, three days, 16.2 days. Um, the numbers from that uh, gentleman from the Department of Homeland Security, their number was actually, a, a, and they were talking specifically about ransomware, the average impact was about $1.6 million. And so what the criminals want you to do is do a little bit of math and say, hey, you know what, for $1,000, I'll give you all this data back. Your other option, go ahead and restore your data. Come call me a week later when that $1,000 seems a lot more attractive than the $200,000 you lost, plus all the ripple effects. So you know it's really important to understand these numbers. And the, the criminals will follow the money. You know, there's Again, there's this kind of thought process that all these attacks are happening on on-premise Windows-based servers. And that's because for the longest time, that's where the vast majority of data lived. And it wasn't to say that other options of, of data storage weren't vulnerable, it's just that there was so much low-hanging fruit there. And you know, we did a, a ransomware report recently, where we talked to folks like Phil in the managed services world, as well as small business owners, and only three in 10, 30% of business owners were highly concerned about these cyber threats going into 2021. 
it just tells the criminals this is gonna be a great year and they're gonna follow the money wherever it lives so as data starts to migrate up to the cloud they're gonna follow that and we saw an uptick they are very opportunistic when we saw uh, you know the COVID hit and we were all scrambling around they were licking their chops and within a day or two they were sending out phishing emails that looked like they were coming from the CDC World Health Organization click here to find out cases in your area and everybody was scrambling around Everybody's on that Johns Hopkins website uh, kind of tracking all those things they even had a website that looked exactly like that Johns Hopkins website that was showing real-time case updates and they you know that was normally being shared on social media You'd click on that. They would go, you know, those mass emails would come out. You'd click on it and, you know, you go to a, a, a site that's going to infect your network. So, again, as you see this adoption rate, this explosion uh, happening, the criminals are looking at this. There, This is now not the guy in his basement anymore. There's a corporate structure to this. So they have the folks that are creating these variants. They have what I would call a sales team. They even have a tech support team. There are places on earth right now where there are people sitting in their cubicles with a collared shirt on, just doing these attacks. Sales reps trying to hit a quota. It has really become, actually, I did a security conference back in June and there was, we were called ethical hackers, these folks that can show you a lot of vulnerabilities. And they mentioned that the cyber crime space would be the ninth largest economy in the world, just ahead of Canada and Brazil. So that's the kind of money that's out there and it is only growing. And when they see a number like 30% of business owners are concerned about it, they're up in their projections. They know it's gonna be a great year. And you know, when we looked at what would happen when that kind of work remote, kind of work from anywhere environment came up, we saw you know, a huge uptick in you know, ransomware attacks on these folks for a lot of reasons. One, you, know, you might be working on a personal device that's not necessarily secure. But more importantly, your guard is let down. It, it's a lot easier to go you know, surf in the web when you're working from your kitchen as opposed to your office. Um, your kids are on your computer, those type of things. So you know, when we looked at some of those security vulnerabilities, again, criminals love this. They love the fact that Jim has never worked uh, you know, at home before. He's got a one bedroom apartment and he's working out of his bed. Well, his guard's gonna be let down. And they're very, when I talk about them being opportunistic, they will send out those emails at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon um, when you're trying to clean up your inbox. And they're gonna do, we, when you hear the phrase socially engineered spear phishing attacks, we all give so much information uh, about ourselves on the web. You can go to my LinkedIn page right now and say, okay, Mike's got his 20 year reunion from Johns Hopkins coming up. That's great. I'm gonna send out an email at four o'clock on a Friday that looks like it's coming from um, you know, their alumni association. Hey, click here for all the information about your 20 year reunion. It's not the email from your long lost uncle anymore promising you a million dollars in his will. They are very sophisticated, and that's where we're seeing the shift. And when you look at specific to Microsoft 365, there has been a huge uptick. More than half of those users have become victims of one of these phishing malware attacks. Again, what this really means is they're, they're not relying on the fact that Microsoft's cloud is not very hard. It really is. It, the cloud itself is safe. 91% of these attacks occur because of user error. Somebody opening the door and letting these folks in. And it really comes down to all the technology in the world. And Phil will talk to you about all these multi-layered approach. If you don't have buy-in and you haven't created this culture of security within your organization, you're going to fall um, victim to these attacks because people aren't going to know what they're supposed to click on. Um, you know, without exception, these are happening because of user error. So all the technology in the world, I, I always say, you know, when you think about cybersecurity, you really got to think of the next level of that, which is cyber resiliency which really breaks it down into people first, then the processes, and then the technology. Without all three of those boxes being checked off, you really can't say you're as cyber resilient as possible. It, you know, when, the, when FBI Director Ray was on the floor of Congress and he was getting grilled, rightly so, about the attack on the US government, he was very forthcoming when he said, look, there's nobody that's gonna look you in the eye and say that you're gonna be 100% protected from attacks that are happening right now and the ones that are happening tomorrow. It's about the ability to be to detect those attacks and then how resilient are you to get back into a production environment. Um, so that really does become critical when you look at that multi-layered approach, where is that data being backed up? Because you're gonna need access to it. And you know, talk about ransomware, but ransom cloud is another iteration where it's specifically attacking Microsoft 365. And you wanna do a quick uh, you know, homework assignment here. It's a very interesting story. There's a gentleman by the name of Kevin Mitnick 
And back in the 90s, he was uh, on the FBI's most wanted list, one of the most notorious hackers in the world. Very high profile arrest when they got him. He went to jail, he came out, and now he's one of the good guys. He's one of those ethical hackers that I mentioned. It's kind of the uh, you know story, of, catch me if you can. You come out and you show what you'd be doing. We actually hired him back in June of 2019. So this is pre-pandemic to do a, a, a demo of a live variant. This is not, wasn't a click through of like, hey, this is what, what might work or studies have shown. No, he said, look, if I was still on the bad side, this is where my focus would be right now. And we'll basically just put up two laptops. Within two minutes, he did this demo. And so an email comes in, again, these are very sleek looking emails, got the logo on it, all the rest. Just need to update your anti-spam pro. You know, you sit through a webinar like this, you say, okay, I gotta be more, you know, vigilant about all of these things. So, okay, it's eight o'clock, first email I see in my inbox, I'm gonna go open it, get this thing set up because I got a meeting at nine. Just accept this. Now, the moment you click on this, every single email is vulnerable. And one of the other things that we're seeing, we talk about a cyber resiliency plan, is making sure that yes, everybody has access to the data that they need, but that they only have access to the data that they need. I see all the time, and I'm sure Phil can attest to it, People just get carte blanche, everybody's got admin access. But if you've got admin access here and you've been attacked, you run the risk of this migrating to the entire domain. And the only email you can click on is this pretty red screen, which if you've ever got hit with ransomware, you've probably seen it, saying, okay, I'll encrypt all this stuff, you send me some money in Bitcoin. And they're almost always gonna ask for it in the cryptocurrency because it's next to impossible to get tracked back to them. And so this is a live virus. This And think about this, this was, June of 2019, pre-pandemic. Think about how much a virus like this has evolved over two months. If all of our technology on the good side has evolved, believe me, they are keeping pace with us. It's a constant struggle. So think about how much more advanced this has been. This is where you see a lot of those attacks. And within our report, you know, quarter of the folks that we talked to, the folks like Phil, they had ransomware attacks on their uh, SaaS applications in 2020. Um, most of them being Microsoft 365, but we did see it in things like uh, you know, Dropbox and Google Workplace. Again, wherever they can get data, they're gonna go after it. And so when you look at the need to protect that, you gotta really understand what Microsoft is saying with their responsibility, like open your, your SLA. Again, they, they've got a very, very secure cloud. So if something happens to the cloud, yeah, that's on them. Um, any sort of natural disaster, but they've got you know, multi layers in place. So the criminals, Again, if you've got a sales quota, like I said, and these criminals have them, do you want to be the home run hitter that's going to go and try to hack into Microsoft's cloud, or do you want to be the singles hitter and go after all these small businesses knowing that, hey, a lot of them don't have processes in place to protect themselves. They're not backing up that data. They're going to go to the path of least resistance. They're going to focus on that 70% of the business community that is not uh, you know, concerned about all this. But you bear responsibility as the tenant whether it's human error, whether it is a malicious insider, and though it makes up a smaller percentage than most other uh, things out there, we saw an uptick in malicious insiders over the last 18 months. Maybe it was the chaos going on, people didn't know, uh, you know where their next paycheck was coming from, but these criminals are going after insiders and offering them big money, six, seven figures to get them in, life-changing money. And so if you're worried about, you're unhappy, your boss is yelling at you, something like that, and somebody dangles $500,000 in front of you, um, knowing that a lot of these folks have access to data that they don't need, well, yeah, you're gonna see an uptick in that. And that goes for viruses, malware, all of those things that the, your employees open the door and let them in, that's your responsibility as a tenant. And again, they, they're very open about that. Um, they've got what's called the shared responsibility model, both Microsoft and Google. Um, they're going to tell you flat out. Again, I've done webinars up at their Burlington, Massachusetts headquarters, sitting next to these engineers, and they will look at the audience and tell them, yeah, you have responsibility here. It is this shared responsibility. That cloud, yeah, we're going to make sure that that cloud is secure and protected. But we I recommend that you back up that data because with everything else, you're backing up on-premise data. If it's critical data, you need to know where it lives, do an inventory of that, see who has access to it, and make sure that only the folks that need access to that data have it. And then you need to say, okay, where's that backup occurring? Um, they're not gonna have any liability for that deletion of customer data. Um, and you look at really what their thresholds are, and this is an important thing to note anyway, whether you're thinking about backing up your data or not. This is where you know the Microsoft stands on these, right? So you look at deleted items, kind of know that, those sit there for 30 days. 
um, the auto ar archive, but you know, start looking at some of these things. Employee turnover, even that's another thing to think about. It was, you know, we're seeing a lot of turnover now. It's kind of an employee market. So a lot of people are moving around. You've got critical data there that lives with that employee. Well, do you want to continue to pay for that license? Or can you just move all of that data over to another inbox and then you could, whoever fills that role now has access to all of that stuff. And so, you know, this is an important slide and anybody wants a slide that you could have it or to see this, but, um, you know, there is a need to back this data. Like I said, you know, they're not in the world of backup. Um, you know, briefly just about, you know, Google, it's basically the same language. They have the same language about liability. Uh, their retention policies are just about similar. Again, they're very secure. It's not to say that this, I mean, not to say that, you know, Google doesn't have a great suite of products, but this is where they stand. Go to their forums and, and talk to them. And, and by the way, if you do need to go recover some data, again, when you're working with a global company, have you ever tried to call tech support for Microsoft and get something resolved in a timely manner? It can be very difficult. So with that, we'll open it up to any questions, but Phil, I want to, I want to bring you back on just to see if you've got anything to add to what we're talking about or some trends that you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I'm just trying to turn on my video here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for going through that, Mike. I, it's funny because even as you're going through some of these things, it, it even reminds me of how important these things are and how easy it is even being in this technology space to lose sight of the importance of data backup on Office 365. So we've seen these attacks against our customers. Uh, most of our customers are on the Microsoft 365 offering and we can attest to the attacks. The attacks are incessant. Um, people are trying to get in and in some cases they are succeeding. And we wanna make sure that each of our customers has I really like the slide, Mike, that went through the the picture of um, kind of the, the, yeah, Microsoft, you may be able to get your data from somewhere, but how quickly can you get that data? You know, when we've had it, incidents where we needed to rely on Microsoft to retrieve something that someone had accidentally deleted, and it was within that period where it was still available, there's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of red tape, a lot of communicating, time can drag on. It can be weeks of opening cases with Microsoft because in their world, the small and medium sized businesses that we are, are small, you know, small blips on the radar compared to some of the organizations they have with perhaps hundreds of thousands of, of users. And so there's really a challenge there with actually, yeah, maybe the data is still there, but now you've got to go through that red tape to get it. So in the situations where our, our folks have had uh, SaaS protection, had some sort of backup that we were in control of, it's just minutes, just minutes to get what they need out of that platform. And 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 you know one of the one of the questions that I would like to to ask you, Mike, um, one of the questions that I get from our customers is you know, what areas, specifically looking at Microsoft 365, what areas of that platform are actually captured by, you know, Datto's particular particular offering? Um, you know, is it just email? No, it's, it's the entire suite of products because, you know, now so much data lives everywhere. So really down through the entire suite. So yeah, back, uh, emails are important and I should have probably added some click throughs about some of those other things. But, um, you know, I could give you a real life example even of, of what we're talking about and, and we're a G Suite shop, but it's the same with Microsoft. I, I did a presentation about a year ago with a sales rep about hurricane season and he had the deck and our marketing team just said, do you have that deck? I said, no, you know, he was running it. And I said, why don't we go? And, and even though he's gone now, he had left Datto we've still got his data. And we were able to pull that slide deck back from the backups of his, uh, you know, uh, there you Google go. Drive. There you and go. it was, uh, I was like, hey, this thing is, and now I get, you know, I talk about it all the time, but it was a real life thing. It was within minutes. And you think about, to your point, it's such a good point. You know, you could talk about the dollars that it's gonna actually cost you to be down, but put it in a person, we all know, if you're down, it, when Twitter's down, people freak out for five minutes. You know, we, we need things right now. And so your email's down or you don't have access for, 15 minutes you're you're texting your boss think about being down for days you know we we know that right. on a personal level so you know the, the the money aspect is important it's one of the things you got to really think about when you're putting together a cyber resiliency plan 
but also just take a step back. We all know what it feels like not to have access. And it, it thinks that that's where we live in, but we need everything now. And you're, it's yeah. you're hardwired to think that way. Yeah. So not only in my experience, is it something that Microsoft's not ultimately providing, but even if Microsoft were to provide it in a perfect world, it, it would probably still be a good idea to have a backup system of your own that you have control over and that you can get stuff out of at your at your SLA, which for most companies, if, if it's a critical file, you need it, you know, within the hour. You know, it's not days. Yep. We're talking about hours and minutes. Um, and that's what yep. I know Datto's product is providing to our customers who are, who are taking advantage of it. Another question here, Mike, for you. Um, you know, data backup is one thing. This is something that I get from from customers a lot. Compliance, right, is this whole world that's just growing and growing and growing uh, for our customers, for MSPs all over the, all over the nation. How do, how do we help people remain compliant in the in the medical spaces, in the corporate spaces when there's acquisitions and private equity, you know, different kinds of situations like that where people want to do their due diligence, right? For a variety of reasons, to protect their investment, to protect their customers, to protect their their reputation, right? Okay, so one of the things in, com in the compliance world that's coming up is retention of data. So, you know, I know that Datto's offering provides backup. Is it, you know, is there any, you know, I see that there's, you know, one of the things that we offer to our customers is your infinite, uh, cloud retention option, could that be used to check off a retention uh, box? And, and I, I genuinely, you know, I, I don't know. And I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that and just compliance in general when it comes to, to uh, cloud mm -hmm. backup. Yeah, I mean, most of these, you're talking about HIPAA, there's actually, New Jersey specifically has one for financial firms. Uh, mm -hmm. With data, and, and that's a crazy strict restraint. Uh, if you have four employees or more, and you're in the financial services space, you actually need to hire a, uh, a CISO, a, a Chief Information Security Officer. So yeah, you need to be able to check those boxes off. And yes, it does. There's kind of an idea with backup of this three-two-one model: three copies of your data in two different locations. And so you know, I, to have that third party stored on a secondary site is of most times part of the check the box. But I will say about the the uh compliance stuff and that goes for NIST, FINRA, anything that's out there. Yes, you want to check off all these boxes, but don't check them off just for the sake of checking them off. There's a reason mm -hmm. why they're there. And they're not necessarily comprehensive. And I'll I'll say, and this is kind of a plug for you guys, Phil, but we have gotten to the place right now in mm -hmm. technology and with compliance that this stuff really is becoming a prescriptive type conversation. Not a hey, this is kind of a, a nice to have. This is a need to have. Yeah. Not just to check those boxes off. But to protect your business that's why we're seeing you know working with a third party like you guys is so critical because especially when it comes to compliance you want somebody to get some eyes on that make sure you're checking off those boxes and explaining the why you know it's only explaining why this is important and put those processes in place so you know we're again we're seeing a huge shift in that kind of mentality with security and data backup in general that it really is you know, it's not a matter of, you know, it's a cliche term. It's not a matter of if it'll happen, but when it'll happen. And mm -hmm. you got to understand uh, kind of a plan of what would occur. All right, what are the next steps? That is a lot of time for compliance. A lot of times you could check off the box just by saying you've done your due diligence and to be able to slide a, a, a plan across the table. I'll leave one more thing. I'll add to, I'll piggyback on that. When you're talking about cyber insurance, then a lot mm -hmm. of presentations with those folks, they are dropping coverage left and right they act the cyber security i mean insurance industry lost money last year insurance companies don't lose money so they're going to start looking it's the small businesses that they're losing money on they're adjusting so again when they when you could show you've done your due diligence it's the you know life insurance you can smoker or non-smoker you a higher risk and they want you as a uh, they don't want you as a client so again there's a lot of reasons to check off those boxes that being one as well it will impact mm -hmm. your the underwriter's decision on on your premium, but also whether they're even going to insure you or not. Did you have you seen any of that, Phil? Yes, absolutely, and that's a great point. I mean, um, I've never had just in the past six months, um, I've had more cybersecurity questionnaires coming across my desk from cyber insurance companies than I've ever than I've ever had prior to that, and it was it was pretty it's a it's a pretty regular occurrence. It's almost routine at this point where a customer comes to me and says, Phil, 
I'm trying to renew my cyber insurance policy and they just they just threw the book at me. I've got all I've got 40 questions. I've got 60 questions. You know, I've got to an answer about my data security and I don't know the answer. Right. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll start, you know, I'll take take a take go through the questionnaire, answer as many questions as I can, hand it over to our tech team. They go through, try to fill in the other blanks. And more often than not, there are areas where the, the customer or even Navitan hadn't felt that customer needed something, but now the cyber insurance industry is almost leading the charge to say, no, we're not gonna underwrite your risk. You're too risky for us. And, and the kinds right. of things that they're looking for, they're looking for protection against ransomware. They're looking for that get out of jail, not get out of jail free, but get out of jail without having to pay an $80,000 ransom, right? Uh, get out of jail, in a way that's reasonable that you know they they're trying to keep their risk down in a lot of ways you know msps and and dato we're really our our kind of what we're doing is mitigating risk for our customers is really what it comes down to the risk that something's going to go wrong the risk that you're going to need to call into our help desk the risk that you're going to need to pay a ransom right we're trying to mitigate risks and um office 365 or microsoft 365 as it's called now the google platform you know, having these kinds of backup solutions in place is one of the low, one of the best, you know, the what's the word I'm trying to say? The ROI is the highest. So the cost is relatively low, but the return in terms of reducing risk is, is really high. So it's one of those low hanging fruit areas for being able to, like, to your point, Mike, not just check off boxes on a questionnaire, but really have that resiliency that's needed in today's environment for those cyber insurance companies to be able to underwrite, to be able to, to renew your policy. So we're seeing that everywhere, Mike, and it's a, it's a great point. Yeah, there's so many ripple effects to these attacks that you gotta consider. And so there's a lot of reasons for this, but yeah, I mean, to me, this is kind of, you know, it's a necessity. This is not a, a cost center. This is part of your business now. You know, there's a, and, and people look at that they already are thinking in terms of either cost per seat and technology or percentage of their revenue, but that is, that is the reality of where we live. And it does, there is ROI to this. There, there is, you know, mitigation to this. And uh, back to the last point on the insurance world, you know, they, it was a new world. I mean, it's not that old of an industry. And so life insurance policies are easy to underwrite. They've got yeah. actuary tables, you know, it's easy. Uh, but when you start to look at, I don't even know how they come up with premiums because it's so much unknown out there for these. Yep. And, and they're, just, they're trying to wrap their head around it. They know they need to continue to offer it, but how do they offer it with less risk to them? This is one of the, re that's why that pay that, that application is probably 10, 10 questions, you know, yeah. three years ago. Now it's 60 yes. pages, you know? It, you're, Mike, you're exactly right. It's funny because when I compare the applications I was getting to the ones I've been getting, it's it's scary because you're right. It's like it was 10 questions a few years ago. Now it's 40, 50, depending on the industry, it might even be more than that. If there's an acquisition going on, if you're looking to be able to sell your company, uh, most likely there's going to be someone assessing the risk of your of your of your organization. And those will be some of the more hefty ones, too. So not only it's not only a cyber insurance thing, but we talked about compliance with with medic within HIPAA. We talked about the SEC, right? Financial, FINRA, those kinds of things. Um, in all of those areas, th these kinds of protections are going to be going to be useful. So, uh, Mike, I don't know if you're seeing any questions or you have any questions that you wanted to to go over before we wrap up here. Um, yeah, I don't see any uh, questions coming in, but most of the time, I get it. You know, you want to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. I mean, my next step would definitely be just to have a call with Phil and his team and talk about it. I mean, we, we covered a lot of this at a higher level, kind of what the threats are, but, you know, have that conversation, get a second set of eyes on what you have. And, and that really comes down to what you're talking about. You have to have a cyber resiliency plan. Starts with an inventory of where all this data lives. All right, who has access to it? And a lot of people don't know. It could be endpoints that are out there that have critical data that shouldn't, but do that inventory, come up with a policy, and then make sure that, Everybody's got access to what they need. They only have access to what they need. They understand the process and all of that data is backed up. You start checking off simple boxes like that, you're moving in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah, so any uh, anybody who would like to learn more, have a conversation about resiliency, how, um, you know, this is, uh, and I just wanna mention the Navitent flight plan process. 
um, that we've implemented here over the past couple of years, our strategic planning process. Uh, Microsoft 365 data protection, uh, uh, data resiliency, uh, having a data management plan, all of those topics are in the flight plan process. And so we've likely, for any customers that are on this call, we've likely already touched on this area. And um, we'll, we'll be talking at it, talking about it again at our next flight plan meeting. And so um, I just wanted to mention that. So, so anyone who's thinking, oh, I don't have time to reach out to you right now, Phil, don't worry about it. We're gonna talk about it. We probably already have touched on it at one point in the past. And so, but if there's anyone who, who wants to know something more, wants to set up a call, there's my information. You can email me or call me anytime and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So uh, thank you so much, Mike, for putting together these slides and going through the content. Um, it was really educational and informative even, even for me. So thank you for your time. Thank you everyone who had a chance to join in today uh, and join. Uh, I'm gonna make this uh, recording available to everyone who's registered and we're also gonna post it on some of our social media channels. Thank you, Mike. I guess uh, if you have anything else, you can you can wrap us up here. Yeah, no, thank you so much for including us on this. Uh, you know, obviously very important topic. We've got the recording. Share it with anybody within your organization. We kept it under 40 minutes so that it's digestible. You can watch it during lunch. But again, the education piece is critical. So make sure everybody understands that. But uh, Phil, thank you so much for including us. Uh, appreciate everybody's time and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Mike. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.